All right. So, so delighted to be here with you today, Marguerite. Um, I just want to let everyone know who might not happen to know that you have been teaching about goddesses and um, in an academic way, as well as in this channeled way. And you started way back in the 1990s with Mary Magdalene and then went off into Mary, Mother Mary Parthenogenesis land and created the most incredible, incredible books that have changed my life. And now you're back to Mary Magdalene and just wondering, how did this happen? How did you yeah. come back to her? Well, you know, it's interesting because I always sort of survey psychically my landscape of what do I have to offer? What What's next? And usually like there's some big cauldron of it that that um, is like, yeah, this is the next thing. And that's what happened with the Magdalene material because it's so rich and I've taught about it in different contexts, um, sort of out in the public and then in academia as well. And I thought, I there's so much more for me to do and offer. And my classes have been going in as deep dives, you know, on, on various topics and, and people and so forth. So this felt like the next one. And um, a good thing that it did, because as I was researching for getting the, the course description together, uh, it dove me back into the texts, which are the basis for the class, the, the New Testament and the Gnostic Gospels. But of course, we're going to make it all relevant to <laughs> ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. But I was either re reminded or I went in and could see with new eyes things that I had not seen before based on all of this research that I'd done over the past 30 years. And a lot of that is going into my, my new book on Mary that I'm finishing up as we're right, as we're recording this. Wow. And so that it enabled me to flesh out that whole section about the relationship between mother Mary and Mary Magdalene. And then it's, it's allowing me to flesh out the course. So I just kind of trust my instincts. Mm -hmm. I'm, I seem to be going into um, the hidden secrets of the Gnostic world more and more and how it's all been there in the West from the beginning and what is there and what does it mean for us? How do we extract what we need to enhance our lives and go deeper into our spiritual uh, path and awakening and even in sension? Right. Um, so there's just so much here. I'm like... <laughs> I, I can't tell you how excited because Mary Magdalene was also my sort of catalytic yeah. moment in goddess. I mean, I think I was into the goddess stuff, but Mary Magdalene sort of, you know, she was a real person. So she had a whole other dimension into all of this. And, and part of her being seen as a prostitute intrigued me even more, you know, what I mean? even though it was the wrong interpretation. Wrong interpretation of the right information, you know, right? <laughs> Do you want to say more about that? <laughs> well, you know, here's what I'm finding. And I think a lot of people over the past 30 years, since I looked at this last time, whatever, um, have been intuiting this or channeling this or what have you. But that what I've discovered is that Magdalene, I, I can piece it together from what I see in the Gnostic sources, especially the Gospel of Philip. And then what I know about Sophia, divine birth, Mother Mary, and so forth, and the, the history of the priestesses that Mary was involved in, Mother Mary, um, there a good case could be made that Mary Magdalene was some form of a Kadesha, whether that was her actual role, title, function in a Hebrew temple or not. Mm -hmm. Those women were, they were very interesting because they could be both celibate and sexual servants mm -hmm. in the sacred context. Mm -hmm. So what we're talking about, and I think what happened is later this degenerated into 
uh, more of a pay for sexual services. Oh, it happens to be in the temple and oh, the temple happens to get the money of the men. But originally this was something else. This was a sacred encounter, a sacred marriage kind of experience. And it, it could well be that Mary Magdalene was one of those women. When we see all the material swirling around her and then the later Christian conflation of her with the woman with the alabaster jar um we you start understanding oh okay she could have been that sacred sexual woman um who was considered a, a kind of a prostitute but not in the way that we think of it now mm -hmm. all right yeah. so that's one of the things we're going to look at in my new course which you have so right. beautiful um the seven sisters uh sorry <laughs> seven 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 is a big number for me obviously mm -hmm. i was born seven seven um the seven mysteries of magdalene that's my new course that's that's launching february 21st 2023 and will continue to be available in replay so you know we're going to look at that who is this magdalene what is that prostitute identifier and how does that relate to her relationship with Jesus and Mother Mary? Right. And what I what I'm really appreciating now is that there was a time where we thought that this connection to the prostitute thing was completely wrong. There was That's no right. connection. There was and, no connection. But now it's like, oh, they just used a piece and turned it against her. And That's just one right. small piece of truth against and let me ask you this, Michelle, in your yeah. research, because I know you're a big Sumer researcher, Inanna yes. yes. researcher, yes. did you come across the, the priestess role of the new gig? Uh, well, I, I came across the Kadesha. Okay. And, it, and the new gig actually I, is mentioned in, I, I know I came across it in my research, but I didn't dive totally into it. But is it related to this okay, as well? well Here's what I found. Okay. And I was able to put this in my, 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 my book, The Mystery Tradition of Miraculous Conception. But of course, there's so much information. How could anyone track? Yeah. But the new gig. You did. That's right. That's why it's also. Basically, yeah. The title of like the first queen of Ur. And it, and it meant um, sacred woman who's also a prostitute okay well that's essentially what the title meant like holy right. woman who's also a prostitute so these were the women who were engaged in these in these sacred sexual marriage rites yes connected with inanna that is explained in the inanna dumuzi story and so forth so right these actual historical women were okay called the whore and the holy one at the same time like the whore was the holy one yes and actually i did research that quite a bit and maybe not under the term of new gig because um the sacred marriage was rampant in all of the different worships of the deities in sumer right right and so the always the high priestess the end priestess was always the human embodiment of the god's wife yes and so she would then and 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 through her she well it's all kind of it's a bit confusing like was it all the end priestesses that could validate the king if they had the sacred marriage with her you know and right. that's how who i studied was then hedwana the first known author and yes. she she was called a sacred prostitute and i only found her oh, was she she but but that was a lot of scholars said that's not actually the accurate term, but again, yeah. there's this connection because w she was involved in the sacred marriage. It's just because it was such a sacred mystery and we haven't had you dive into it to help us right. <laughs> elucidate, you know, from this perspective. Um, I, I only went so far, but um, we don't know exactly. It's like they kept it as mysterious as possible, of course, but there is hinting all over the place that when she became the high priestess, there was a sacred marriage rite ritual yeah. and they yeah, burned, high, they burned um, the bed afterwards. They, they got, there's clay tablets that show all the 
all the all that was ordered for this ritual it was such a big deal wow i'm just getting chills uh, right i mean it's 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 like there's proof and yeah. um i'm happy to betty mador is the one who actually wrote about Love her this. you heard i know her? i have or had her book um I know, um, Inanna Lady of the Largest Heart. I'm yes, Inanna Lady. Right now, it's it's on my bookshelf. I can see it right there. I, and I was deep into this for a while. But this is the context. Yes, yes, yes. Do you mind if I just close my shade? Because of course, yeah. There's going to be a lot of sunlight. I'm going to get my water. Surprising, <laughs> surprising advent of sun here. Um, so... This is part of the context in this part of the world, the Levant coast, the Middle East, whatever you want to call it. I'm not sure what the correct term is these days, you know, <laughs> but um, Iran, Iraq, Sumer, Mesopotamia, this was what was swimming around in that world. And it irks me to no end that scholars deny that there could have been a sacred sexual right, you know? And there's a whole anthology devoted to sacred marriage, looking at this and and yet, you know, it, it's just so weird, you know? So I've been in there looking at, okay, what was sacred marriage versus part sacred parthenogenesis, which is the virgin birth piece. So I see Mother Mary and Mary Magdalene as bookends, okay? So- Mother Mary conceived the avatar right. and Mary Magdalene continued his lineage, but Mother Mary and, and Mary Magdalene were both Marys. They were priestesses, what I call of divine love and womb mysteries. Okay. So that's a major thing that we're going to be looking at in the course. And that is part of my next book on Mother Mary. So these are profound mysteries about on the esoteric level, what were these women all about? Right. And why were they all named Mary? And, you know, that being a priestess title, right? I've, I've talked about that. Um, yes. So now we're just stirring the pot with more rainbow colors when we add Magdalene into it. And this is part of her, part of her mystery work. And then, you know, I would call this, you know, the sacred marriage part, uh, the sacred marriage mystery. Oh. But, but this is also for, you know, divine womb power uh, connectivity and kundalini activation. So that's one mystery. And then we have the bridal chamber mystery, which could be related to that. But that's big time in the Gospel of Philip where it sounds like it's a couple coming together into the bridal chamber to have a sacred sexual encounter without any entities involved, okay? But the bridal chamber is also an inner process, right? So that's one of the mysteries. And how is this relevant for our lives? How do we have this inner marriage mm. so that we can have the sacred marriage? Mm. And what does that mean on the planet then? When you have a sacred marriage, what I'm getting right now is that you conceive different types of children that I have always known, right. but putting it all together with also what Sri Kaleshwar says about through a mantra practice, you can, a couple, a regular old couple can conceive divine children. This is about getting in the next generations of children on the planet who are a much more elevated vibration. Mm. You know, they can go to planet Zordon to work out their karma. Let's have a lot of, Let's have the souls who are ready to help turn Earthship around mm -hmm. come in now. Mm -hmm. The star seeds and beyond. Mm -hmm. Not that they're not coming in, but we need more consciousness in the area of conception. And, um, you know, it is said that Magdalene, that's one of the things we're going to be looking at, some of the details that Magdalene had one or more children by Jesus. Was was one of them Sarah? A Sarah La Cali. Okay. Okay. And that's in the French legend, right? Right. Well, that's an interesting name. What the heck is their daughter being 
named Sarah La Kali for. Well, Sarah is an ancient priestess title yep. that was given to Sarah, the wife of Abraham, who, as we know, parthenogenetically conceived yes. Isaac. So, the you know, <laughs> we're talking about these lineages of womb women and conception mysteries. So the, the daughter was named Sarah mm -hmm. La Kali, which connects her with Kali and the Hindu tradition, mm -hmm. which according to Sri Kaleshwar, Jesus did live in India. His timeline is that Jesus resurrected to India. Body and soul, and that Mary Magdalene joined him there. They had children and their lineages still continue. Oh. The French legend is that, and the Western legend is that mm -hmm. Jesus left the earth plane, resurrected to full deity, maintained his contact through the astral plane with people. Mary Magdalene was previously impregnated. Right. Um, or it could have been a posthumous thing because Isis had that posthumous conception with Osiris. Right. It could have been that mystery. Right. No one for sure knows. Uh -huh. um, and that and that their lineage lived on in France. Right. Okay. So there's all this material kind of swirling around about where did these people go? What did their lineage do? Is their lineage still active with their vibration? Mm. Right. And I think, you know, in a way, the Da Vinci Code was trying to get at that with Sophie. Isn't isn't Sophie Neveu? Is she an ancestor of this whole thing? It turns yes, out. she is. Yes. Right? Yes. So what you know, this is why the there would be a periodic renewal you know, of the sacred king, because the energy would only last so long on the earth plane in, in three dimensions once an avatar came on. Mm. And so, you know, how long can that DNA transmit mm. the energy of Magdalene and Jesus? That's an interesting question. Never really fully went into it. Right. Um, what do you think? Have you encountered Kathleen McGowan's books at all? You no, know, she's a novelist. Yes. You know, I haven't, I know of them, but I haven't read them. She, okay. she tapped in, she's tapped in. She's tapped in. And it's very interesting because her focus is how the lineage of Mary Magdalene was continued through her devotees. Yes. And one of them being Anne Boleyn. Wouldn't doubt it right and many others of, of women that we haven't even heard of and it's so fascinating she dives into the research and turns them into novels so that she's not right. you know ruffling too many feathers right um that you know all these mysteries that we start uncovering when we really look into the histories of yeah, these exactly it's extraordinary it is extraordinary and it's again when you were talking about in the fey course um how you said that there was, there's been so much interference in the sacred marriage. That's right. The right. course in Guinevere. Well, Dan Pullin and, and Henry VIII are also have been messed up that way as well. No kidding. Yeah, they, she, they slandered her, but she was actually trying to bring in the Magdalene and a whole new spirituality. And that's why she- I just get chills. Isn't that intense? Yeah. I mean, She's written a two-part book, and the first one only has come out so far. The second one will come oh, out. Bless her heart. I'm so glad she's diving in. You know, she's, it's amazing. Oh. You go rummaging around <laughs> what you find. I know. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, it's just fascinating how all, you know, what you're bringing, everyone's bringing in pieces to fill this in. And yeah. when you said earlier, you're saying that the woman with the alabaster jar is a conflation. It's not really Mary Magdalene. Well, here's the thing. It never outright states in the canonical gospels that the woman who poured nard or myrrh oil over Jesus' feet or head is exactly Mary Magdalene. Okay. But a cumulative argument can be made by looking at the overlaps between that story in the canonical gospels. Mm -hmm. And you know, Margaret Starber just made the out and out case that this 
this woman with the alabaster jar mm -hmm. was the same as Mary Magdalene, who was removed of seven demons and was um, a noble person who had money and supported the Jesus group. And the same as Mary of Bethany, who was the sister of Lazarus, who was a dear friend of Jesus to the point where he operated Parakaya Pravesh, the yoga to bring a person back to life on mm -hmm. Lazarus. Okay. Mm -hmm. So she thinks they're all the same. Now, of course, then there's this more recent scholarly book um, that I think tries to debunk that or take that apart. You know how it's it's interesting. I mean, nothing can really fully be proven, right? And the thing is that what strikes you as true, right? And this is what's going to be, you know, in the class and, and it's kind of everything I do. It's mm -hmm. what strikes you as true. Yeah. That is your medicine, right? Because there could be multiple timelines around this event that people are either remembering differently or it went down differently yes. or you know on the most esoteric level yes um it could be that there is a timeline of jesus going to india with mary magdalene da 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 after the crucifixion living a life there there could be another you know the france story there could be a there could be um you know, multiple, multiple things that right. went on and didn't go on. Right. And I think what we need to do is just say, how is this speaking to me? What is there for me in this? What does my soul karmically need to know, learn, grasp, and apply in my own life based on this? That's great. I mean, you're teaching the sovereignty of your own connection to the divine, which is going to be I, I think ultimately that's what mary magdalene probably and jesus were all connected to as well exactly because especially when you look at the gnostic gospels pista sophia and gospel of philip and others kind of oh and the gospel of mary magdalene i wanted to ask you about it, that because it's all there i mean they're going deeply into you know um quantum physics new age philosophy that is perennial, like it's been around forever, but it's all there. And now that I'm like going back into these Gnostic gospels after, you know, a decade or more of going into all this exploration, I feel like I do want to do a, a next teaching, which is like the Jesus mysteries, because mm -hmm. he's talking about all that. And he's talking about the archons and the negative forces. And when you look at the Gnostic material from that perspective, you're like, oh my God, suddenly this obscure thing becomes completely clear. Mm -hmm. It's like, it might as well be Magenta Pixie or Elizabeth April or Lisa Renee channeling it, you right. know? <laughs> so so great. it's, it's just astounding. Like our, the veils are coming off. Yes. yes. And we're like, Jesus was talking about this 2000 years ago, right. same problems. And it's so funny because when I first read, you know, Mary Magdalene's um, gospel, I, was trying to find the embodiment because that's my whole trip is, you know, and I did find clues of embodiment, but then when she went into angels and all this other stuff, I kind of just tuned out and I couldn't handle the darkness and the this and that. And now I'm like, when I'm tuned into what's going on now, I'm like, oh, whoa, yes, this, you know, I can understand this better now. I can actually understand her gospel better. And I will learn so much more in your course, but you know, I, it's like, it's because yeah. we're only ready for what we're ready. And That's right, they, and the world was only ready for what it was ready for. Yeah, exactly. Now it's becoming so obvious to so many people. Yeah. What they were talking about, and they came in to address this archonic incursion okay. on the planet. They really did. Right. And when when you read any of the apocryphal works about what they encountered mother mary i'm talking about her in my next book what she encountered in her visions and on the other side mm. Woo. scary scary right they knew all about this that's why they came in that's why they came in probably as a soul group right a soul group yes 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 wanted to ask you um so you do one of the mysteries has to do with anointing so you do do you connect her then to the woman with 
the alabaster jar you yourself. yeah I really in the end I do yeah in the end you do okay yeah be, uh, and here's also why okay not just that yeah when I went into the apocryphal gospels of mother Mary uh -huh. her biographies which are quite old some of them might date as early as the second century that's like practically you know a little while after she died yes um they call you know maximus in the life of the life of the virgin i think um calls Ma mary magdalene one of the myrrh bearing priestesses right. okay there right. so they're not just relying on a cumulative argument based on the uh gospels okay so that is a key you know there it was way long ago and that's what we're going to look at in this course what is a myrrh bearing priestess beautiful right and i believe it or not spent a whole year taking a course on the scent priestess and its connection to mary magdalene so we worked with is that diana dubrow diana dubrow oh. and elaine kalila Doty. i know i just spoke with her tell us about that tell us well, about that. what does she what does she teach in that yeah okay. well i mean it's just profound because i i was connected to the essential oils like 35 years ago or whatever it was and i i chose a particular oil for myself the first one and it turned out when i was in this course um uh, um diana tunes into each woman and decides what is her I don't, can't remember what she calls that particular oil, but it's your personal oil. God, ooh, more and chill. She, she chose the oil that I first chose for myself. Gosh, are I you going to say what it is or no? Yes, I'm going to tell you. It's called oh. it's Ylang Ylang, which is okay. You know, hello. It's so connected to the whole sacred marriage and all of that. Which I've been interested all along. That's why I was interested in, in Mesopotamian stuff was the sacred marriage thing. I mean, actually, I think I, yeah, I told you that the sacred prostitute theme of Mary Magdalene led me to discover the high priestess and Hedwana. Yeah, wow. So I didn't, because they were both called that in this Jungian book. And, right. And I have to tell you also that there is for the first time ever happening in New York, a show on Enhedwana and other women who wrote, it's called She Who Wrote, Enhedwana and other women, 3400 BC to 2000 BC. It's the first- I'm about to keel over. What? <laughs> no. I, I can get to New York City. And I was just saying- Oh, good. I gotta go to New York City. Why on earth ever would I wanna go? Where is this? Okay, it's at the Morgan Library. And it's only going until February um, 19th. I'm going to be at the show on the 18th if you want to. What? Yes, I'm going. I would never, I, I've been avoiding going to New York, even though I made a documentary about Enhedwana. And I'm in touch with the curator, Sidney Badcock, since way back when. He finally pulled it off. And he retires right after this show. This is his crowning achievement of his career. Oh, it's the Morgan Library? The Morgan Library in New York City and yeah, wow okay it, it ends the 19th and it you know what Whoa. he says he says it's the very first show of the ancient near eastern field that's only focused on women it's never been done before you know <laughs> I mean, it, and it's uh, not going it, to any other museums the first poet of re oh, crazy first of all crazy uh the first poet of record was and had if that had been a man, right, as we <laughs> said, it would be plastered all over the subway. You know totally, what I mean? Totally. Oh, the first poet of record, you know. I know. I mean, and she's doing sacred poetry, for goodness sake. Exactly. She she wrote, she is the first person to um, name herself in writing. They were anonymous scribes before her. But wow. she actually included herself in wow. these writings to Inanna. So she's promoting Inanna as the, as anyway, I don't want to get too carried away, but uh, there's major connections. And he, the, 
the curator, Sydney, says that he thinks that this image, I have to share this image with you, might yes. be in Hedwana herself. Um, oh my God. But we don't know because it's it's after her time period. But the, I just have to show you this image as I've always just thought, oh, it's another high priestess like in Hedwana. But oh, guess yeah. what she's holding? Well, she's holding a jar. a jar of potentially oh. ointment. Alabaster, right, yeah. A jar and of here, oils. And I, I'm telling you, Marguerite, I've been immersed in Hedwana for, you know, more heavily in the past, but she keeps popping into my life. And now this piece comes in right when you st you mentioned the the jar, the alabaster jar, which I've heard of over and over again. But because I just tuned back in, I was reading all of your material about the alabaster jar. I'm like, look what this priestess is holding. Yeah, the alabaster the jar. Alabaster jar. <laughs> I mean, I just keep getting chills. And I think we should just go off in this conversation wherever because it's okay, rare good. that I get to be with somebody who is steeped in this material in this way. And, mm -hmm. and this appeals to, you know, particular people, but it also opens it up to a, a larger audience to be able to say, oh, it's not so scary to read the poems of Enhedwana. It's not so scary to like, go look at that book to see what is the history of that? You know, like this is accessible. They only make it seem like, oh, you have to be a scholar. A scholar, I know. Which, you, I mean, I have to tell, sorry, I'm interrupting you because I'm all, yeah, no, and Juan is thrilled. She, she buzzes through me for sure. And she's thrilled that we're acknowledging her right now. And Let's it be. she, um, I've already lost my train of thought what you were saying. Oh. When I was, when I discovered her, first of all, I found her in that sacred prostitute Jungian book. I, and, and all I read was I and Hedwana, high priestess of the moon god. She, that's what she says in the poem at one point. She's introducing herself. And I literally felt like a buzz go through me. And I was just like, who are you? How come I've never heard about you? You just spoke in the first person. Like to me, that was the most accessible thing she could have done to get my attention. I was like, yeah. you're a real person. Right. I, and, I know. And then I was researching like crumbs in the libraries and there was just like they were saying very dismissive things about her in the archaeological record. Very dismissive. And then, you know, the 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 distancing factor is that it's these languages are a I bit know. inaccessible, you know, like at yes. least okay, the farthest I'm willing to go is ancient Greek. But it's like all these other things are like, I don't know how to decipher and see if they translated this right or wrong. Right. I know. It's so and that thing, they translate stuff yep. in a weird way. Exactly. Through their lens. Through their lens. And it's yes. wrong half the time. So then you have to have some intrepid female feminine scholar go in and be like, yes. it didn't say that. It said this. It said that. Or it could also mean this. Right. No, a whole other, you know, our father, Hail Mary comes out of it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I interviewed this woman in Berlin because she did her dissertation on the most famous poem that Enhedwana wrote. And not many people quote her. And it was in German. So I paid a translator uh, me and Betty Mador and two other women paid for a, a, a translator to translate her whole dissertation into English. And she asked me, she said, do you want me to translate this the way it's written or in a way you'll understand? Because academia writing is so right. you know, hard. And I still had to like comb through and I asked her a million questions and she was so amazing. She's in my, my documentary about in Hedwana. And oh, she, wow. We should have that link um under the video oh good yeah uh, is it available online because i yeah, think it's on I youtube it. yeah perfect yeah. i loved what you did years ago and that's how we met right? right um wow okay so this is the world of the magdalene i know i've always felt well, there was a like magdalene, magdalene right yes. there's like there's now i'm seeing even more connections and the fact that magdalene wrote a gospel so she also wrote you know, and that's the thing. It's like, no one knows. Did she write it? Did someone else write it about her? Right. Certainly she is the starring role in it. Right. Okay. And she was freaking smart because Jesus talks about her in various of the gospels. Like you're right. the one who gets it more than anyone. Right. So, like, she was a noble woman or, you know, a high level. So she could have been educated. 
Yeah, definitely. Okay. Definitely. Um, in terms of writing. Right. Um, yeah, like what, yeah. What if she wrote that gospel? Okay. She, I was so. she did. You're right. She might not have. Right. We, it's just, it's unclear. Unclear. Okay. Um, right. Okay. That's good. But to the know. fact that she's the main one, um, who's described in it and that she's receiving esoteric teachings. Right. That's right. That's a biggie. That's a biggie. My other, um, I've forgotten if I even, why is Mary Magdalene always associated, which I just want to say, I love your burgundy oh. jacket. It's kind of um, pink. Or, what what yeah. is it? It's kind of pink. It's, it's my pink. favorite store, Serana. It's a, it's a double-sided thing. Yeah. <laughs> and the necklace too. But you're wearing it because of right? The theme of red. Can you talk yeah. about this color of red? And I'm going to share just another I, few pictures. Like, for example, okay, yeah, go ahead. Sacred scarlet reds, red pinks. Um, to me, that is Magdalene. And, you know, she was always associated with that color, Mother Mary with the cobalt blue. And yeah, see, this picture is stunning. It and is. today she decided to wear this again. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Serana Clothing Store in Berkeley, California. Everyone oh. else buy things oh. online. The necklace is from there as well. Those, but that necklace as well. It's a real to be a queen store kind of. Um, Andrea Saran. So um, I will check it out now that I'm in the neighborhood. Oh. Okay. Well, that's a whole other story. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so red, the woman in red, right? In red. We just associate Mary Magdalene with red, you know, the scarlet harlot, right? Right, okay. That's and why? The, the idea, I don't, I don't know why. I think it's one of those things that we pick up on yeah. in the Akashic records. Okay. That, you know, this is more her chakra. It's the root chakra and mother Mary is, you know, the third eye, the crown and, and all that. So they're both ends of the spectrum, right? When you consider, and that's how they were, the how they were divine birth priestesses. Right. One was dealing more with the earth plane and the other one was dealing more with the astral plane, although they both are dealing with both. Yeah. And I just think, you know, this the red ray you like you always hear the blue ray the green ray the yellow ray the... what happened to red i read it got a bum rap along with mary magdalene <laughs> yeah. are there any star beings out there who feature in red we don't know you know like it feels like the missing color yeah you know of and the spectrum in terms of spiritual connectivity yeah through the realm of light so it's like if she's the red ray you know what is that it's it's also like the ray of blood the ray of menstrual blood right exactly and the that's ray of the interior of the body yeah. um so i think that there's some way that it's Mary Magdalene's embodiment that is expressed through that. And it's mother Mary's ethereality that is expressed through the blue. Right. And I think like the scent um, journey, right. As, as Elaine Kalila said the other day with me, she's like, any one of these things was a entire mystery school, you know? And it's like, <laughs> you know, we could be here for days and weeks and months and years, you know, just looking at, the rays, the sense, right? You know, all of these things and their connectivity to the inner realms of reality, the deeper dimensions. Yeah. And how deep to what dimension are we going? Can we travel? Right. So this is the amazing thing about this material. And it's like the endless font, the gift that keeps on giving, because right, like looked at it in the 90s, now with this new view and you yourself 
looking at this old material and then it's like, whoa, I didn't see that before. Mm -hmm. And I only know that because of this and that and the other thing and that material that I got directly, mm -hmm. these revelations. So this is why this is so exciting because it enlivens us. It awakens something within us yeah. that's more than just, you know, intellectual fascination, although that is very stimulating, but yeah. it's, it's how do we translate this into our chakras? Right. And kind of, you know, in a way, that's the course, the seven mysteries of Magdalene, Magdalene, what we're doing so that we can mine her wisdom for our own lives, our own spiritual journeys, our own healing, right. and then our, our service in the world of the archons. Mm -hmm. All right. Because it's, they can't just do it as a little group. <laughs> we all have to get involved in this process. Right. If you want to deal with these archons that are there at every rung of the underworld. Yeah. You know, I have to go back to the sacred marriage again, because yeah. um, Enhedwana's poem mentions that when she, she like in the poem, she's talking about a historical event that happened where the Sumerians were sort of fighting against her father who was an Akkadian and was trying to join everyone but you know he was sort of taking over and she represented that force yeah. and so this this Sumerian king expels her from the temple which was so not something anyone else would have written about because that does not look good um, and she broke that tradition right wow. she shared that she got expelled and she's asking Inanna for help because the moon god who she serves has sort of not showing up for her. And she's she's like, Inanna, you're this, you're that, you're amazing. Because she's also promoting her to the top of the, the pantheon of the gods and goddesses. And um, he hands her, the king Lugalan hands her a dagger and says, this, this serves you um or whatever this suits you better and he takes her crown, aga crown away which proves that she's the end priestess which means that she would channel ningal wow. the goddess the wife of the the moon god like that crown was hey she becomes the goddess in certain rituals here yeah that's like a technology of yes. some of some yes. kind okay okay and then <clears throat> she says in the poem because she's expelled, she can't do what she normally does as the high priestess. And one of them is she hasn't, she says, I haven't stretched my hand out to the sacred marriage bed. Like she's referring to this ritual. She yeah. actually is referring. And I never could fully understand, but there've been new translations and different people uh -huh. bring in different shades. And now it's much more obvious that she's alluding to the sacred marriage that she was involved in. Wow. And it's like, oh, man, gee. Yeah, there we go. So yeah. she was like, not only writing, but she was, you know, engaging in these sacred womb mystery, tantric encounters. Exactly. And it wasn't like she was doing it on the regular. I don't think it was that kind of thing for her, but it yeah. was part of her office. Yeah, it might have been reserved for special, very special occasions. Because exactly. at that high level, that's what you have. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, they there were certain and priestesses and kinds of priestesses, Naditu priestesses. The Naditu were definitely, um, uh, what do you call? Uh, celibate. Celibate. Yeah, they were. So they weren't necessarily doing the sacred marriage, right? But they owned land and they were right. respected. However, it's that weird thing where, yes, they're, they're said to be virgins. And right. yet, and you yet. Know, I look at that in the, in the mystery tradition of miraculous conce conception in the section, right. one of the chapters on Anne and the section on Sarah and her context. It's like, right. huh. And yet, you know, there were these laws governing um, whether if a child was born of a right. sex. That's if right. A child was born. I thought this was a virgin. <laughs> this is the confusion. Yes. Virginity with this. So it, it really brings up 
when were the women celibates and when were the women simply sovereign bridal chamber people who had affected the inner unity right okay and you know going back to esther harding's good old virginity means whole unto yourself right so it's like what is the role of sex and what is the role of celibacy and could you choose you know or were there different times where you were having to be celibate in order for this sacred marriage ritual to be special probably yeah You know, because Apollo at Delphi, the woman had to become celibate in order to be his wife. So she's channeling as Apollo's wife. Again, we have that wife of the God thing. Right. Channeling, receiving information. And there's a sexual erotic kind of connotation about the whole thing. Right. This is a mystery that we're like unfurling here. Yes. And I think more, there's going to be more to come about this. Yes. Because even I, when I talk about Mother Mary, I talk about the erotic nature of her parthenogenesis. You had to become one with the erotic creative womb, comma, desire womb of reality in order to, you had you had to have the, the male, female yin yang within yourself fully in order to give virgin birth right so that was erotic it was sexual so i do talk about mother mary as a sexual being yeah but I know, she which i love it all up. she saved it all up right right yes i mean and that's related to the whole tantric uh lineages it feels like there's i don't know if you have included any of the that sort of that's a whole other it's a whole other study and I just yeah. allude to it, you know, okay. <laughs> well, I use the word, but it's like, go off and research your own. There's other people, you know, there's that woman who wrote the book. Um, oh God, I'm forgetting now, but it was like her own kind of encounters with, with this path in India. Are you recalling? Um, it's been many years since I've even looked at her book. Um, it's, <sighs> I believe it's in India anyway. Okay. The practice of um, sacred union, you know, sexual union okay. in ritual. It's it's not coming to me, but anyway, okay. Well, I'm thinking also, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. Well, I was just thinking, um, I have read about, you know. Um, Miranda Shaw. Oh, Miranda Shaw. Passionate and light. Oh God, I love it. Kind of- cloaking her own story yeah oh is she I believe so not to out Miranda Shaw but you know um she's amazing yeah about the the sexual nature of ritual passionate and like passionate enlightenment yeah no that book is that book blew me away and I have revisited it because there's so much in there yeah and what I'm also, what's coming to mind also is, you know, in the tantric tradition, it seems like often it was the woman, the enlightened tantric priestess who enlightened the man. Like That's right. Sri Kaleshwar, in a way, pretty much states that out, that all the male gurus had to get their power from the womb chakra of the females. So wouldn't that lead to rites and rituals? Right. Transmission. Exactly. Yeah. And that therefore the sacred marriage was not just a potential conception rite, but a transmission mm. of the comma womb power to the king so that he could raise himself up in a way that his physiology was not fully allowing access to. I'm getting chills with what you've just saying there because I've just been researching about the, of trying to find the history of the jade egg oh and the jade egg all they can say this is all anyone has said and i haven't done a deep deep dive but mostly all they can say is that the um the concubines of the emperor and the queen were the only ones who knew about the jade egg and 
often they say it's to keep them vital and alive for the king's the emperor's pleasure but it was right. also i found it was to help him right so what to you're keep saying that womb energy flowing to him not just sexual pleasure energy yeah. but power power so the queen would have to keep her womb alive for that continual transmission to the king yeah so that he could rule in a divine way yeah of course my gosh that all went to heck and look at henry whatever his name you know over there with anne Boleyn. right i mean that's kind of like the nader point of what can go on yeah exactly. so <sighs> <laughs> so yeah I, this is why i love these conversations because they're it's like we're bringing through information together yeah right and i I really hope that everybody watching is getting, you know, stimulated open your own intuitions, right. um, whether you've been steeped in this material or not, whether you've dipped into this material or not, that it's resonating somewhere for you. That is, you know, I know your and my ultimate intention here, our goal. Exactly. Yes. Because you start being opening, opening to clues that that's what I loved about your work is like, the, those those books all that academic research with all these clues this this language that you've uncovered that then we start can apply elsewhere we're starting to see connections and bring yeah. in that to me is so exciting i love seeing it that. is it you is know? and it's it's in it's intuitive scholarship it's the intellectual and the intuition coming together which is the magdalene mm -hmm. okay because Jesus was like, hey, you're the smartest one. And Peter's like, what do you mean? What is the meaning of this? I am the head, <laughs> the male cohort right. of this community. Therefore, I am the entire head, which he wasn't. Mother Mary was. Right. However, and even Peter like would defer to Mother Mary. Mm -hmm. I talk about that. He would, he would get into a power struggle with Mary Magdalene, but he would defer to Mother Mary. Ha, ha, ha. very interesting so that's something i'm bringing forth um but uh there was a place where i was go oh yeah okay so this coming friday february 17th on my youtube channel is going to be a live lady cannabis ceremony with me for the global community where the focus is going to be on mary magdalene so i'm going to be in high oracle state and then it will be recorded. It will stay on my Marguerite Regal Yozo YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. But anybody can go there now and, and hit the notification bell and or afterward watch this and replay mm -hmm. to see what happens. And, you know, if you can come, Michelle, it's 1130 a.m. Uh, Eastern, excuse me, on Friday, February 17th. It would be great for you to t -t 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 your questions, okay. like start getting your questions in. <laughs> All right. Yeah. And we'll look into it because um, when I'm when I'm in that super open place, mm -hmm. a lot of information comes through. I mean, God, I could be going for several hours on that one. Um, and I'm really excited. I mean, this is the first time I will have looked at the Magdalene material in any deep way right. in ceremony like that. Right. Um, and opened up the questions to the global community and, you know, just really in prep this week connecting with with mary magdalene like what does she want revealed and wow you know she's all about service she's all about uh, others um humanity i know she's her, about humanity she's often you know connected to the way of love as as kathleen mcgowan would uh, coin it the way of love was was how the followers identified themselves they were following the way of love wow and that would be the mary name mary comes from miriam mariam which comes from mary in egyptian which means love divine love the beloved mm -hmm. the loving one the one who is love and it was an honorific title connected to isis so the mary is the priestess of divine love love that and that's what elaine 
is also, I think in, in Rosa Mystica, we were yeah. focusing on that as well. It's beautiful. And I love it how when people come at it from different angles, right? Like, oh, the, the Egyptian verification of yeah. that. Yeah. Whoever, right? Right. And, and it is, know, it's about love and it's about love and passion. Magdalene was so much about love and passion together. That's the red. Exactly. And the heart is red. The, the heart is red, the heart chakra. So, you know, there's, anyway, I just, yeah, I, I appreciate the, you know, because I had to wear red because of that. And I yeah. just, <laughs> you yeah. know, I just feel like it, you know, um, and the blood and, you know, an honoring of the, oh, this is something I wanted to ask you. Did you see in the news? Apparently, a few weeks ago, there was a gigantic red cloud that looked like a vulva over Turkey. Hilarious. And they're calling it a UFO shaped cloud. Hilarious. <laughs> oh my God. It's like the Yoni. The Yoni. The, the, the Holy Womb Chakra over Turkey. She's over right Turkey. There, and it's I mean, like we're starting the year of the yin rabbit with a bang wow right right amazing i want to see that one you know i have it i posted it on and it's Facebook. like even if it is the aliens it's like why that shape why know. you know they're like hey let's shake it up a little bit for those earthlings <laughs> <laughs> maybe they had a female crew maybe they were from venus you know, Lyra, whatever. You're like, oh, hey, and... this one's for you. <laughs> they know that it's all these geeky, you know, disclosure people are usually. Right? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I love them, but still, you know, it's largely a male thing. It is. It really is. So apparently these clouds, they're called lenticular cloud formation. Oh, yeah, lenticular. And they're often, they're usually white and they look sort of like spaceships often. That's right. Well, this you one happened. over Mount Shasta, the top of Mount Shasta. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah, there was one over the mountain where I live here. Uh, <sighs> yeah, like years ago. It's been documented. Because these mountains are portals in any Right. Event. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. So just, I got to see this. Please you, send it out. I will send <laughs> Well, it also reminds me, I, you know, when I was really researching a different goddess each week for my womb power class, I discovered a myth about Pele. Oh. She was about to be raped by the pig goddess, God, sorry, a pig God was about to rape her. Her sister saw this and shape shifted into a flying vulva. He got distracted chased her all the way from the big island to oahu where she slammed down onto the earth and trapped him and there's a crater there that looks just like a large vulva hilarious <laughs> so it's like she's back over turkey you know? exactly what is she she's trying to you know get the distraction level going <laughs> is that the amazing atrocities and wow and in Ho in Hawaii, they they totally recognized that they called they called it the koelele, the flying vava. And and they called the crater koelele something until the missionaries came and called it coco something, and which meant blood. So they wow. were keeping somewhat connected, but just couldn't handle the, the vulva aspect. You know what? We should talk to Elon Musk or whoever it is that's getting these crafts together. Right. And make sure that he has a vulva, <laughs> a flying vulva. All right. I mean, they can even start doing it with cars on the planet to get people <laughs> used to it. A vulva car. Wouldn't that be just so great? Amazing. You know, Mary Kay would probably take, <laughs> take up on it. You know, they have the pink car. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what I also want to ask you. Have you ever seen when women, um, you know, they, they show the, you know, the, the yoni in this shape and they show that they, they think that the yoni looks like mother Mary or could be Mary Magdalene, you know, totally. right? Totally. Absolutely. I mean, all the images, the Virgin of Guadalupe, yeah. all always in this, it's a, it's a vulva. 
to vulva and there's and and i also feel like there's a connection to the egg and that you know this whole egg thing with mary magdalene after the there's that image of her holding the egg holding the egg that one. and i know that that's connected to easter and that apparently she brought eggs to maximus and was saying you know you 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 did Jesus wrong basically, and she was standing up for Jesus apparently, and oh. he and she said something about she could prove she turned anyway she turned the eggs red. See there we go. There's another you know connection here between the womb, the egg, the egg, which is the you know it's one of the primordial shapes. Yeah of the vulva or of the womb in a sense right it's what contains the universe within it because when you look at the fractal of the mandelbrot set when they plot it out in coloration um and you can go and see these things online the mandelbrot m-a-n-d-e-l-b-r-o-t it's a fractal that they're plotting an equation on the imaginal plane this is so interesting they did it with ibm computers anyway it's an endless fractal okay that goes in and in and in but the the main image of it when you turn it right side up is a womb it's almost anatomical they always put it the other way so that it looks like buddha sitting there but if you turn it upside down it's like this looks like the interior lining of the womb and the vagina um but the exterior of it, how the exterior of it looks is an egg. So it's like, which came first, the yoni or the egg? <laughs> right. All right. Now there's something for you people to put on a bumper sticker <laughs> on that yoni car that you're going to get going. <laughs> That could even be, you know, the tagline, the marketing of it. So, but this is what we're talking about. Like what came first, the yoni or the egg? Right. This is a deep philosophical universal thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure probably that was in the missing five pages of the gospel of Mary. Of Mary, I know. Isn't that so frustrating? Like, the missing pages. What was in there, you know, and gosh knows what other documents, you know, this is why people are just channeling, you know, yeah. accessing the Akashic records. Right, right. If you can't get it from the archaeological record yet, yeah. it may appear down the road still. That's what I love is that eventually there's little discoveries. Validating everything, the terma <laughs> that show up, you know, the little terma, the hidden things. Right. Uh, yeah. And then, But it all goes back to what I just love your ultimate message is that, well, in the meantime, since we don't have these proofs, we have to source within and... Yeah channel or just go with what the intuition feels right yeah yeah and because they may have burned the library of alexandria but they cannot burn the akashic records <sighs> even though there have been attempts oh wow this is what i'm receiving by the archonic forces oh wow even though that's one of their things they want to get rid of that and they want to get rid of um karma so that they don't have to pay for what they did or they don't have to receive the the ramifications of what they did Whoa. they were trying to do that yeah atlantean that was like the deepest levels of atlantis and stuff so we can still access the akashic records which is why oracle work and channeling has gone you know it's been shown to be demonic and you know whatever it is uh people's pineal glands have been shriveled so that we we're not accessing because the akashic records is still there even though they've been trying to do away with it so it's all within it's all within and i i i'm i'm still not exactly because i don't relate to the akashic records so much but i relate to embodiment and the intuition yeah. that comes through it's all in you. It's what Jesus was saying 
in those gospels, the inner is the outer, the outer is the inner, the kingdom of heaven is, or your queendom of heaven is within you. Right. That's what that teaching is. It's the embodiment teaching. And I think that's what Magdalene was all about. One of her mysteries, I call it bringing heaven to earth, where, you know, she's ascending and descending seven times a day in the cave in Santa Baum toward the end of her life. Okay. Yes. Because she's bringing it in. I, I just read that recently. Blood red into the oh. blood red reality of human existence. She, say that, say, what, what did you say about the blood red thing? She, She's bringing it into the blood red the reality. Blood red reality, right. Right. And, you know, um, in the Anne Boleyn book, they talk about going, the, the pilgrimage, Anne Boleyn went to that um, with, with um i can't remember she was she was basically being trained by uh french queens wow and they were yeah, who are supposed lineage. to be in the lineage of <laughs> mary magdalene yes. yeah and they oh. went to that cave and they saw where she had the they climbed up where the ascension thing was happening wow See yeah that? yeah I mean, it's so profound, you know, and, and and it's like, okay, so it just leads us to kind of get quiet and go within ourselves and access that bringing heaven to earth and access all the knowledge to be known, all the records, all the timelines, all the histories. You and, um, you know, the activation of our DNA, the full activation of our divine human DNA, the Anthropos, they were really big on that. And in the Mary Magdalene gospel, oh. they're talking about we are attempting to become the Anthropos, which is the divine human. Oh, wow. They were all about that. So it's like an honoring of humanity and the divine coming together That's where right. it's usually cut and it's all up and it's not, you know, the, the womb and the yoni and, you know, right. it's like, these are two separate systems. That's right. Yeah, I know. It's like un uniting, weaving together the womb, the heart and the third eye, right. As right. three of the primary areas of the body that need to be woven in and that women intrinsically have, or could recultivate that connection. That's a lot of what I'm about and what the Magdalene work is. Cause here she is a seer who's a tantrika, who's a priestess of love. Right. Go. And because I, I, I often wonder about you because you are so prolific. I mean, you're constantly bringing in new material. I wonder what do you think is sourcing? How are you staying fueled and energized to be able to right. do that? Do you well, you know, one thing I started doing was walking uphill for a half hour three or four times a week to get my chi and my blood flowing again. I have to do it in a more rigorous way. I have to take care of myself physically. I have to um, sleep well. Mm -hmm. I have to eat mindfully. And um, I'm not a you know fanatic about anything. You know, Marguerite, she still eats gluten. All right, do not take away her gluten. She's <laughs> Italian. She has pasta occasionally. Um, but it. it's more like, and also I meditate now every day and I do the running of energy, working colored light through my system the way I was taught in my psychic school. Okay. Does a lot. And every day now, I am asking Mother Mary to merge with me, all of her chakras with mine, activate my supernal light body or the Christ Sophia light. And I ask Mary Magdalene to merge her holy womb chakra with mine. Oh. And I'm trying to like explore what's the difference between Mother Mary's holy womb chakra and Mary Magdalene's, you know? I think Mary Magdalene's is a little more focused on the Kundalini, comma, desire energy, you know? Right. And so those are just things that I'm doing right now. You know, it is, it has changed over time. Um, but I did do that running of energy practice that I learned in psychic school at the um, foundation for spiritual development in San Rafael, California for, for many years, for like 10 years. 
<clears throat> and and then I, you know, I regularly work with Mama Cacao, and now I'm back working with cannabis a little bit mm -hmm. um, as an opener. Mm -hmm. But you know, because of the psychic training and that running of energy mm -hmm. at will, you know, even in our conversation, I'm just getting a tremendous amount of information. So then it's just a matter of like writing it down, like making right. sure that I write it down. Right. Um, but which the yeah. writer in you really is a huge asset. Yeah. I know, you I know. know. Really, it's a blessing. I mean, I understand those scribes. I think I was a scribe. Yeah in numerous lives where I would just be like writing things down, recording the every move of King so-and-so, you know? Oh, totally. Uh, yeah, and, um, but then, yeah, I've been in nunneries where I was educated. Right. And, right. Uh, so I have a lot of that education energy that I bring in and that love of texts and, and reading and, and also just taking time off, you know? Mm. Uh, that's important, you know, to have balance right in your life. It's not a 24 seven burnout situation, right? You have to get with the fairies. You have to get with the outside world. Mm -hmm. The fairies are a big part of my life now. Right. I love that. And, you know, over time you become more and more open, wiser and receiving more information. Yeah. I am moving into that phase of life, right? We all are. Yeah. And more comes. Yeah. And it comes because you're not fighting it and you're still, you know, and I, we're taught, told that this phase of life is not very exciting. It's not very right. sexy. It's like, blah, you know, it's all downhill and it's like so far from the truth. Yeah, they, they want you to do that, the Archons, because they know it's easier for you to access the Akashic Record material. And the more you keep your hair white, the easier you are seen and located by divine sources. Now that is so cool. That is yeah. so beautiful. Diana Dubrow must instinctively know all about that, you know. So it's like, ladies, you know, reconsider the dyeing of the hair because it's like putting tar um on your hair and it it prevents your crown from being able to access potentially not necessarily forever and anyway this is just what i've gotten right some material some of the information well i have to bring this to the woman who i interviewed who um used to balance my hair with sacred geometry she was cutting with sacred geometry she still does and she trains people and she has played with the gray coming into her hair in all these fabulously inspiring ways, helping women. She said that COVID um, totally blew the the whole exactly. gray hair thing off because I started stopped coloring. Like four of my major <laughs> friends stopped, and they look fantastic. Yeah, exactly. It's so it, and she has all this stuff about the crown chakra and how cutting the hair is your hair is your cosmic antenna. That's it. Right. And so if you're cutting exactly. each strand three different ways, you're you're tuning this whole wow. system. I know it's fascinating. Because so a little while ago I was thinking, I really like Michelle's haircut. Oh. <laughs> so I don't know if she's been working on it, but unfortunately um, she hasn't. This is the first um, one that didn't get cut with sacred geometry in a long time because I've moved away. <clears throat> oh, right, right. But um, thank you, though. I appreciate that. And and I don't color my hair. There is gray coming in because I'm blonde. It doesn't show. That's right. That's but right. I yeah. yeah, I can't color my hair without I, I got a rash when I got highlights. <laughs> and so there's just no way I can do right. that to myself. Yeah. yeah, I know. We just need this um, this antenna. And it's like what I'm getting right now is that you might think that it's loss of vitality, but it's actually a tuning up of your connectivity. That's interesting. I mean, I never like fully, fully, because on the human level, you're like, oh, right. Um, aging, it's diminishment, you know, and they're like, yeah. he, not every aspect of aging is diminishment. Yeah, exactly. It's expansion. So, yeah, it's Deepening. expansion, you know, 
And then there's that whole thing about Mary Magdalene in the cave. Yeah. She had very long dreadlocks or whatever it was, right? They even picture her sometimes as fully covered That's in- right. That's right. I saw that image and that was like, right. if that didn't say something about hair Rich and its power. Hair. And it's power because she needed that to be going to heaven seven times a day. <laughs> right? That was like her little, you know, part of her access mechanism. Oh, and that's true. They often say that she was redheaded. I don't know if you. Oh, no, I never that. heard that. Okay. Yeah. Some people, there's traditions where there's some Celtic connection with her. Oh, I love that. But of course, because, you know, Lisa Renee talks about um, Mary Guinevere Sophia, or she equates, she really puts together Mother Mary, Mary Magdalene and Guinevere. Yeah, in her, in her um, Shifting Timelines audio and written blog, mm -hmm. if you go through the past couple of years, you'll see almost every month, She's making that connection between those those three and Sophia and showing us their ultimate, you know, star level, mm -hmm. um, astral interdimensional connectivity, that they're all like octaves of one another, Arthur and Guinevere, Mary Magdalene and Jesus, right? Right. Um, and so that's that's a very important place where we're all starting to draw these these threads together now and understanding oh this is part of even one larger being that might speak to different peoples at different times and different right. cultures and you know who knows what's in other cultures and other races and things like that that would be the equivalent and there is uh some mythology around mary magdalene going to avalon or glastonbury i don't yeah know. I, I'm, yeah, I know that Anne, grandmother of Jesus went. She did? Okay. She supposedly is buried at the foot of the tour. Yeah, I know. It gives me chills. Um, and Magdalene, yes, I believe that she did go there. There's lore about her being there with Joseph of Arimathea. Right, exactly. Okay, so that's a whole other. I, right, which you you obviously are focusing in on. You can't include everything about Mary Magdalene, no, of course. It's no, it would just be new layers based on some of the more familiar things that we've got, you know, yeah. things that haven't quite been said before or looked at in with this Right, angle. which I so appreciate. I mean, you're you're bringing in the whole divine birth thing in a way yeah. that, in fact, your work was what, in, which, which finally shed light on the sacred marriage stuff that I wondered about in Mesopotamia. Like, I was like, how is this ever going to be understood? And then you are talking about divine birth. And I was like, oh my God, this is all starting to come into way yeah. more. That's right. It's part of a complex or a continuum or something, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, the Kadesha as virgin and whore. Yes, yes, yes. As virgin and harlot. Gosh, I was just about to ask you about something. It'll come back. I know it'll come back because it's like it, it went away and came back. And <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, these things are, yeah. Um, yeah. This is so integrating, you know. Mm -hmm. So many pieces are coming together that is just. Mm -hmm. I know it's like now is the time on the planet. It's a very activated time for this. And for Yoni vehicles to be flying around in the sky. <laughs> you know that there's going to be some other kind of Buddha story about it. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Uh, let's just, I'm going to just tune in with you to see okay. what else is wanting to come, up, uh, yeah. come through for this conversation. Oh, okay. One yeah. thing. If, mm -hmm. May I interject? Sure. Okay. So you talked about Catherine Ann Clement. Um, yes. Her work. And I remember when I read her book eons ago that they talked about Mary Magdalene and Jesus and how they were having non-physical sex. 
Okay, interesting. Right, so this would be Catherine Ann Clement, who is the one who regressed Claire Hart's song. Claire Hart's song, right. To be able to receive yes. the two books of material that she did. Anna, Grandmother of Jesus, and then Anna, Voice of the Magdalens. Right. Now, I poked in those books years ago enough just to see that she was verifying divine birth as light conceptions and things like that. Light conception. I love that term. Light conceptions. Okay. Um, and I have not, they have, I have had them for years. I wouldn't ever part with them, but something is internally telling me not to read them, at okay. least not right now. Okay. Same thing with various other people. Um, just to keep to my own knowing and um and eventually it will be fascinating to see what she says but one thing i do know is that she says as did sri kaleshwar that jesus had numbers of consorts right and whom he impregnated and that's a little uncomfortable to hear and i remember reading at least part of the area in in um Claire's one of Claire's books that this was uncomfortable for her uh to be channeling through that you know Magdalene there were others and Magdalene had to deal with some of these other women yeah that I didn't want I didn't enjoy that part either. I know I didn't enjoy that one so let's just look into that because it's like what is that you know maybe that's medicine for somebody but that would be also a great thing for the the cannabis, the lady cannabis, Santa Maria ceremony. Okay. Um, but just for me and us to tune in right now to you know, the question is, what's the difference between sacred marriage as a monogamous situation? and sacred marriage or tantra as a polyamorous situation mm -hmm. because we get very upset about some of us mm -hmm. about the more than one thing mm -hmm. well what i'm getting is that also that is a factor of patriarchy where it was so deeply threatening for women to think about their partners having multiple partners because they were dependent on the male economically. And so there were a lot of distortions that came in. And it's it also got twisted into male only polyamory, not female male, female polyamory as well. Um, what I'm getting right now is they're, they're saying, well, it ain't that easy to be either monogamous or polyamorous. It, it's any type of relationship is going to bring up the arconic forces into your situation mm -hmm. because of how we are on the earth plane right now, where they are hooked into our wounds. This is why the bridal chamber, as mentioned in the Gospel of Philip was a purified, rarefied place where a couple would come together without any interference by these archonic forces. In order to be able to do that, they, in a sense, needed to already have affected the 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 um say the bridal chamber within, because that's where they weren't as vulnerable to those outside forces if it was two bridal chamber people coming together right. in the bridal chamber. Um, so they're like, don't worry so much about polyamory monogamy. They're like, just focus on your inner bridal chamber because that will determine your level of empowerment on the earth, your level of comfort, your choices. And for some people, you know, the monogamy is the medicine right now, like just perfecting one relationship, you know. Um, 
for others, it's perfecting multiple relationships. And if you think about it, the Kadesha would be having, um, they were the women who were having the multiple partners. Okay. So right there, now that's suppressed. That's very, and they're just called whores, prostitutes. They were polyamorous priestesses. Okay. Whoa. What a Boom, look at here we go. I mean, this is new, you know, this is new. And this is what happens when we get into like, we're two or more are gathered and we're getting into our open state. Yeah. So this always happens, you know, together with you, Michelle. <laughs> so, um, so, so they're saying, just take a breath. Don't worry about that. Focus on what you need for your own life, which is enough right now. Yeah. Um, there's, there's distortions and misuse of sacred marriage monogamy, and there's distortions and misuse of polyamory because we're still working with getting rid of those demons that Mary Magdalene had to get rid of and so forth. So that's what, you know, just don't worry so much about it. I love what you said that the inner sacred bridal chamber within, is that how you call it? Yeah, the bridal chamber within. Bridal chamber within. I feel that that is very connected to women taking ownership of their sexual energy. Yes. You know, like we've been basically yes. told not to, in you know, ashamed into owning our sexual energy. And right. And I think that it's going to be different for every woman, but I mean, cervical orgasms are cosmic spiritual experiences. And that's what the Yoni egg does. Exactly. I personally, you know, that's how I have been able to have a cervical orgasm best is with the, the yoni egg. Um, wow. Now, you know, some women are able to have it with a phallic encounter, yeah. um, but we're all working that out because there's so much tightness that's been put in there, exactly. tags and whatnot, you know, Indigo Angel, it does a lot of clearings for people. Mm. I do think that Kaleshwar's Holy Womb Chakra mantras are meant to clear, clear, clear. Mm -hmm. It's another technology for another clearing. Technology. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that yoni egg, that jade egg allows for the cosmic orgasm. And, and also I, I've been tuning into it just through um, energetically. Uh, not that I've had the cervical orgasm yet in this um, conscious way. I did have one by accident in the jungle of Guatemala when I was 27. Wow. <laughs> With, wow. Um, and this is where I feel like there's a connection to say to um, divine birth is that I was, I had just met this English guy, hadn't been met very long. I was traveling with two Argentinian women who left me with him. We went on this hike. I got almost dehydrated. I couldn't like, he, I'm like, don't touch me until we get back. Cause I've got to drink water. Once we were lying down on this hay bale in this little dirt hut, you know, um, we were just hanging out, relaxing, and he was barely touching me over Ioni, barely, barely. And then at one point I said to him, I said, wow, all I can feel is my head. My whole body is merged with the universe. Wow. And I didn't know what it was. I had no idea what it was. I didn't know when it started. I didn't know when it ended. Wow. And I was in this state for three days, <clears throat> semi sort of um, act, you know, uh, aroused and just in this very wonderful state. And I've, it's only now 30 years later, 30 plus years later that I'm like, oh, I'm going to learn how to do this. I can actually, I now know that everything I've been teaching in womb power is actually leading to it. Right, right, um, exactly. <clears throat> cosmic orgasm. Cosmic right? orgasm. Um, and I know the jade egg was part of it for me in my studies so far, but yeah. I'm, I'm saying that, you know, there's different ways for women to do it, I think. But I love that you can do it with a jade egg. Yeah, try working that jade egg. I you just started. Pull it yeah. up and down and okay. up and down okay and you just make sure it's nice and okay here we go you know for everybody 
just make sure that it's nice and lubricated and you just keep pulling it up and down. And at some point you won't even need clitoral stimulation. Um, you will be able to have the orgasm by itself. So there's something about that of how it touches the cervix. The cervix. And strengthens the, strengthens the walls of the vagina. That's it's right. Very uh, articulate and mm -hmm. alive. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. And it is something that a woman can keep alive throughout her life. Exactly. Okay. The aging and vagina is a myth. It is a myth, you know. With with that tool, I do also think Christiane Northrup's formulas of Puraria Morifica yeah. as both a pill and a yoni cream uh, salve are good. It definitely builds up the vagina for sure. Yeah. Um, so these are, and you know, that's working with the plant world. As the body changes, then you work with the plant world, mm. not necessarily a pharmaceutical hormone which is going to lead you down, you know, paths. So, yeah. right. Okay. Wow. So here, this is Magdalene with Mark and Michelle, you know, <laughs> she's like very practical. All right. She had a yoni egg in that cave. <laughs> How do you think she was going to heaven seven times a day? <laughs> woman was doing it. <laughs> so, yeah. Which again is also this inner sovereignty, like, yes, it can be accomplished in sacred union with the masculine. And right. I've heard, you know, women, women and women can have cervical orgasms also with fingers and, you know, yes. like, and then women alone. That's right. Need to know that they can yeah. develop the skill on their own if they're not in partnership. That's right. The sovereign and Yes, and it is about that inner bridal chamber. And Elaine Kalila in our conversation earlier this week said, so I'm not like sharing anything that's not public. She said it in that in that conversation that she had experienced um the inner lovemaking. Now imagine that. Because all of our inner lovemaking has been fraught with fantasy that comes from the pornography industry. Yeah. A lot of times, yes. which has all those arconic energies. And it's like, get that out of me, you know, but it, 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 it hooks into us. It's so addictive, right? I mean, this is the thing about clearing, clearing the, the yoni space and the mental space around arousal. Yes. Yes. That's yes. the bridal chamber. Cause they, they are really talking about not having those entities in there. Would you say when you're working the jade egg and you're, I guess, maybe intending to have a cervical orgasm, if that would be the same as what Elaine was talking about, the inner lovemaking, or are you differentiating? Yeah. Mine is physical. Oh. Hers, I think she's getting somewhere, okay? What you want to do is unify your yoni egg and your cervix with your heart, right? Yes. Yes. And then your head, your cosmic, yes. that, that is one orgasm, all right? Exactly. And uh, that's when you'll have what she's having. <laughs> exactly. Right? So I think there's so much work play to be done for women, for themselves with this. Oh, yes. Oh. Um, right? Sovereign. And, you know, maybe that's why so many women are, single right now they, they have an opportunity to look into this yes. yet don't know so much about it yes and yet it could be a very satisfying way of being but it's not just the physical yoni egg thing it's these other aspects of the inner bridal chamber and the seeing that magdalene had so i feel like she's really bringing in some stuff. I'm going to have to listen back to this, Michelle, and like bring it into that particular class. Good. Um, for some practices with some recommendations for yoni eggs. Yes. Maybe yeah. you could do that. Um, oh, sure. We'll have links to where people can get them. Yeah. And I, I, I do think though, also that just 
the bec becoming aware of sensation in the cervix and yoni and womb, just by doing that, you're bringing down the descending feminine energy. That's right. And then when you go into the body, you actually activate the masculine ascending energy. Okay. And you bring it up to the heart and it goes. Wow. So this, this alone to me is a huge, huge aspect of the energetic aspect of having a cervical orgasm energetically. Wow. And to me, I'm wondering if that, I mean, to me, that sounds like a marriage of the, the feminine. That's right. Of course. It is part of the inner bridal chamber. Exactly. It's the ma masculine feminine unification. Yeah. The yin yang, yin -yang. right? So to speak. And yeah, I could see why there would be a whole mystery school <laughs> devoted to this. Right. I think, you know, you're doing that a lot with your work and your courses, yeah. right? You're retrieving information um teaching it to other women and it's it's coming from being in this part of the body that there's so much resistance and shame and right. wounds that need to be that's right you know let go but the more you go in the more you let go and the more things yeah. come in that's yeah. how it's evolved for me because i didn't intend to go here yeah it's yeah just, it's like time well, this is all quite profound because it's all about, yeah, you know, with the timeline of Mary Magdalene being in France and Santa Bohm, becoming an older woman, presumably. Yes. Um, yeah. What were her tantrika practices at that point? Right. And I think, again, yes, an entire mystery school <laughs> of this that, it, it, you know, people have been getting pieces or doing aspects of this. And yes, um, there are people, Anaya Sophia has been talking about uh, post-menopausal sexuality and arousal and things like that. Because mm -hmm. um, that's a whole big shift in a woman's life. It's like a bit of a shock, like, whoa, the yeah. hormones kind of made it all easy to be aroused and things like that and to have right. an orgasm and now without so much of that whoa where does this leave us you know right um this is a big area a big mystery i know you're onto it i know you're working <laughs> it. and yeah mary and mary magdalene i think magdalene you know carries more of this valence yes I'm in a causal sexuality. Yeah. Um, yeah. She's good to have around as a mentor, like access her. Yeah. Ask her. Right? Exactly. Exactly. And she's always been a guiding light, I think, because of this valence, whatever age. Yeah. You know, because many yeah. women, myself included, basically suppressed that energy. I mean, that's I why I can't not anymore, because yeah. I'm like finding out what I was missing out on in terms of not even in terms of like having great sex or anything. It's more like accessing your life force and your essence and your ability to stand up for yourself and have boundaries. And I mean, there's so much power internal that is essential and sovereignty of your beliefs, everything. Yeah. Yeah. And this is why any of the work that can take off these clamps on that part of the body is very important. You know, you're doing that work. I'm doing that work. Sri Kaleshwar brought forth Indigo Angel, Z Earth Star. Um, those are the ones that I immediately know of. And I know, you know, there are others. Many, yeah. Um, so because Sarah and Bertrand, Sarah and Azra Bertrand have a very yes. beautiful on the Magdalene mysteries and I'm I'm starting to look into that oh it's amazing yeah I would imagine they are tapped in for sure they are tapped in yeah um as as a sacred marriage couple right who are having children yeah um and yeah so as we as we get older in our bodies in our human bodies right so this is this is a whole other area like 
Because I think that on some level, I was like, well, Mary Magdalene, you know, now I'm postmenopausal. Okay, that was for when I was all, you know, juicy and blah, blah, blah. Now, and through this conversation, I'm realizing, oh, Mary Magdalene on a whole new rung of the spiral. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. now then there's also the mystery of totally rebirthing the body and rejuvenating and living for hundreds of years that was another thing that was going on in antiquity and whenever yes yes and we hear it talked about in like um boiling people in milk or whatever kids milk or something kids uh -huh. like they're, they're, goat? you know the animal yeah the goat yes. um and there there was a ritual that went wrong and they boiled the guy to death you know wow. but that was a that was an immortality ritual where you you go through a death rebirth rejuvenation of your body mm -hmm. physical body wow that's a whole other thing um and there's you know those in in mesopotamian mythology they would list the kings from very beginning and how old they were and they lived they hundreds of years they lived same in the bible right, right. because because of many different factors and at some point in antiquity, it was like, well, we're not naturally living this long anymore. So how can we artificially induce this? Mm. Um, and it, it required a, a physical repurposing after a while, a rebirthing. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, I, I, I think that, you know, our longevity is longer <clears throat> than it was for a period of time. But I think it's it's coming to a new level of where there are more natural ways for that to be occurring. That's right. Not just about medicine that's, you know, Western medical ideas of what, how to stay healthier with vaccines and this, not the other, whatever they consider, right. you know, like, and, and part of it is the sexual energy and being able to, that's right. That to refuel yourself. And you know, who's a really great one for this Montauk Chia. Chia. Exactly. Okay. Now he's taught some classes at the shift network that I feel like I should be checking into that. Um, cause he provides these old ancient Asian, I'm not sure what cu culture methods yeah. of stimulation of the breasts and this and that. And then it yes. used the circuit going on and on. Yes. I mean, it should be, the, it should be in kindergarten class. All right. It, absolutely. Um, so there are these things available. Yes. Absolutely. And he's talking about like this gives you endless vitality. Exactly. Exactly. And the functioning of your sexuality. The so called taboo subject is actually the most rejuvenative healing aspect. That's right. For your health. That's and, right. And connects you to your spirituality. Like it's just been completely. It's a hijacked area. Hijacked. Major, major feeding trough. Yeah. Um, yeah, we could go on and on with that discussion. <laughs> but it's interesting how this is what's coming up for us with the Magdalene conversation. I love it. Because I well, think she is the governator of this whole thing. I agree. I so agree. And, you know, I, I just know for myself, it took decades for her for that aspect of her to finally come through yeah. for me and so i'm just so grateful and i honor i'm so glad that that's part of what you are yeah caring about her you yeah know? because yeah well it's up to the minute almost in the moment reception of this information wow. as we're gathered and gathering like i'll have notes for the class but then more stuff is going to happen and then you know there's so much for for everybody to continue on with um on their own so you know i'm going to just be able to bring forth some pieces yeah. and practices that people can work with amazing but i'd love to see this yoni egg come in because i think a lot of the people in the class are going to be um post some will be postmenopausal women so called mm -hmm. and i think we need that healing to know that magdalene is not just for young hormonal women exactly exactly yes 
she lived a ripe old age yeah and had so much to give and right that's right and so this is what happens when we start opening to these mysteries and these women and these people mm -hmm. and their deity aspects mm -hmm. their anthropos um incarnations wow Wow. I'm so glad that we've been able to have this conversation. And um, yeah, I'd like to, in the show notes, I'd like to have your course, if it's still available, sure. in the link. Um, and then, we, of course, we warmly invite people to come to the Seven Mysteries of Magdalene course at sevensistersmysteryschool.com slash Magdalene. And um, that will remain available and replay on into the future. So, yeah, I'm I'm excited about this because as I really delve in and open, it's like, oh my god, the end, the well is bottomless. I know. I'm so excited. I mean, I think it's going to be off the charts. I mean, yeah. everything you do is amazing, but it just this feels so exciting on a whole other level. <laughs> it's this level. Yeah, because it, it connects with so many people who have been tuned into or forced into Christianity also, as well as those who are like, weren't, but are like, wait, hark, what is this Magdalene? What is this Mary? You know, yeah. um, so it's a lot bigger than Christianity, but it's it's providing a healing balm to a lot of people who have been experiencing the archons connected with Christianity. It's getting us to the esoteric substratum the endless stream well you know of this material are you so you're uh, what i think i just heard you say is that part of the formation of christianity had the archon influence right from the start it came right in yeah at the crucifixion and before okay. you know what i mean like they were like feeding right off in in fact just after mother mary gave birth what do we have? They knew it was fun, right? Herod is smelling a rat right. that they're finally born two children, John and Jesus, and he's like, "Oh my God, find them and kill everyone, kill all the babies." We can't have these avatars running around. And she's like, "Holy crap!" Right? You know, so they're on the run. Right? Okay. Yeah, that makes so much sense. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and they were just facing it every step of the way. Right. And it's that same in plain sight thing where, you know, Christianity was supposed to go a different direction. That's right. In fact, it's the deepest level of any esoteric tradition there. And there are other traditions, but it, it got into that substratum. It emerged from that. Of course, the archonic forces are just feeding right off, twisting undermining, hijacking, um, uh, turning upside down, you know, everything they do. And Lisa Renee is the really good descriptor of how that goes on mm -hmm. on internal planes. Uh, I mean, it's harrowing when you see in the technology that's involved by these forces that in go into include AI. Right. You know, so it's like, be that as it may. Right. <laughs> We are working with our supernal Christ Sophia light body. That's what we're focusing on here. The anthropos getting all that stuff, you know, emerging, birthing ourselves like the rose, like the lotus, getting all that stuff off of us yeah. and communing and communicating through that. Beautiful. Wow. Thank you for doing this. Oh, you're welcome. The way you can weave all of the history, academic, channeled, and archon, archons, and what to be doing today, you know, okay. and all that woven together and integrated like that. And guess huge. what? The Kadeshim were the weavers. They were? They were the weavers. Mother Mary was, quote, weaving when she conceived That's Jesus. Right. So it's all about the weaving function the weaving energy right. neath 
the great autogenetic goddess of all, you know, was a weaver. A weaver. That's right. Okay. So we are weavers. We are the weavers. And whenever I see anything about weaving now, I think of how you talked about it in those, those yeah. books. The early books. Yeah. The cult of divine birth in ancient Greece and virgin mother goddesses of antiquity, especially where I talk about me. Yeah. They are the weavers. And that is a great creatrix function. I, 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 I just keep connecting, weaving and integrating like the two, you know, this is how we weave within ourselves, all of these planes, multi-dimensions is we have to integrate it. Even the image of DNA is a weaving image. Right. Okay. And that's just even the simple minded start of two strands of DNA when we're being told, hey, there's 12, 13, 24, 48, you know, what does that mean? Wow. Talk about weaving a tapestry exactly. of, the holy, of the holy of holies. Right. Okay. Yeah. So that's what we're about. What does this mean for our lives? Weave that tapestry of the holy of holies, people. You are the tapestry. You are the weaver. You are the holy of holies. Beautiful. Blessed be. Blessed be. Thank you so much, Marguerite. This was Welcome. beyond what I could Thank imagine. you. I know me too. Thank you, Michelle, as always, for your hearted work. My pleasure.